Amen. Well, if you have a Bible tonight, we're still in First Peter chapter 5, and uh, we're looking tonight at verses 5 to 7. First Peter 5 and verses 5 to 7. Peter writes these words. Likewise, those of you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Well, it's great to gather again, isn't it, in the presence of God? Uh, the Lord Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, sanctify your people by the truth. And it says we look at the truth of God's word as we consider it, what it says to us, what it means, how we can apply it to our lives. It's in this way that we actually grow as Christians. And Peter's been saying that all the way through the epistle. He says you need to desire the newborn milk of the word. You need to feed upon it because it's the living bread. It's the food that God gives to us. And it's through this word that real change comes to us in our lives. Uh, So if you were here last week, if you were here last Thursday night, uh, we looked together at the passage about the work of elders. Uh, Before we even looked at that even, we considered, didn't we, who elders are? That they are men who are called by God and enabled by the Spirit to oversee and shepherd the congregation under under their care. It's not something which... um, men appoint other people to. It's something that God himself sets, sets men apart to do. And not just any men, not just anyone who's born male, uh, men who are above reproach, the husband of one wife, gentle, able to teach, and all the other qualities you see in the scriptures. So we considered who the elders were, that they were a godly qualified men. And we also saw there the elders' task. And Peter broke it down into a few different sections for us, didn't he? He said, firstly, to those who are elders, shepherd the flock of God. What's the work of an elder? It's the work of shepherding, isn't it? To know the sheep, to feed the sheep, and to lead the sheep. That's what an eastern shepherd does, just as you see in the 23rd Psalm. You want a good word to describe a pastor, an elder, it's a shepherd who leads his sheep to the living water of Christ. He said you're to shepherd the flock of God if you're an elder. You're also to exercise oversight. That's not the nice side of being a pastor or an elder, but you're to keep an eye on things. Administer discipline where necessary. Say to people, you're going the wrong way, you need to come this way. You're to open the doors of the church for some people, welcome them inside, and you're to shut the door to other people. You're to feed the sheep, you're to shoot the wolves. All this is included in exercising oversight. And how does God want shepherds to exercise oversight? He said he wants them to do it willingly, not under compulsion, not forced, not for shameful gain, not for the money, not abusive, but being an example to all the flock. It's a high calling, and you might wonder, why would anyone take this job on when it's so full of difficulty? And yet Peter says, doesn't he? he? He said, for the elder who serves well, for the elder who follows Christ to the end. He said, their reward will be the unfading crown of glory. It's not a reward for salvation. It's a reward for service. If salvation's a free gift, we get it the moment we believe. But if we serve God well in this life, he promises to give us rewards, doesn't he? He says, to some I'll give one city, to some ten cities, but we'll all be given jobs in the new world based on how we serve Christ here in this world. So the elders' task to shepherd the flock of God, the elders' reward is to receive the unfading crown of glory. All this and more we saw there in the first four verses of 1 Peter 5. Now as we come to the passage tonight together, uh, Peter turns his focus for a moment off the elders and back to the congregation He wants to encourage the congregation to respond to the elders in a God-glorifying way, to have a good relationship with their elders. 
And as he does this, as he speaks in this little section of scripture, he's going to use a couple of words that we really struggled with today. Words like submission and humility. And there's a good reason why we struggle with words like this today, isn't there? And we struggle with the idea of humility because we're naturally proud. And we all have struggles with different things and a lot of our struggles can be traced back to our pride. And we struggle with the idea of submitting to leaders because there's so many corrupt leaders today, isn't there? There's so many leaders who are in it for themselves, even pastors who just want to beat the sheep, they want to control them in ways which um, Scripture says they're not meant to. You can understand why we struggle with this, both because of our sinful nature and because of the bad examples we see in people. Not everybody is worth following, are they? But when we come to these topics of submission and submitting to elders and humility, we don't need to look so much to our experience. We need to come to the Scriptures and say, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say about these things? How are we to relate to elders? And what should our attitude be to humbling ourselves? Well, as we come to the passage tonight, we're going to see the answer to those two questions. Uh, there are a couple of things I want to draw from the text for us tonight. I hope they'll be helpful to you. And I hope you'll see them clearly in the passage. Uh, firstly, we'll see in the text a call to submit to the elders looking at what that means and what it doesn't mean and what the promise is attached to submitting to your elders. And secondly, we're called, going to consider together submitting to the Lord. They're considering what it means to submit to him and what promise is attached. And I pray as we consider these very practical commands together, as we seek to have a right relationship with our elders and with the Lord himself, I pray that we'd see where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That this isn't to, to bind us or make us a slave of men. But actually when we follow God's commands, we end up being the most free of all. I pray that God would show us these things together tonight. Uh, so with that in mind, then let's come together and consider firstly the truth that we're called to submit to the elders. The truth that we're called to submit to the elders. So last week, unless you were fully asleep and not listening, you would have gathered that the sermon was all about elders. Uh, Peter laid a foundation for a healthy church. He said there must be elders, there must be shepherds in that place. And not just one shepherd, but actually a plurality of elders. Even if they're not local, they must be involved in the decisions that the church is making. It works something like this. Christ is sat on his throne. He's the king who rules in his kingdom. And he told his men, his apostles, he said, teach people in the world everything that I have commanded, commanded to you. Teach them to obey everything that I have said. So Christ is on his throne. He gives his word to elders and they pass it on to the congregation to call people to obey Christ. That's how we get God's word for us today. And the Grace Church Book of Order, it's quite an old document. I think it's maybe from the 1800s or something. It puts it this way. It says, Jesus is the mediator, the sole prophet, priest, and king of the church. He is its saviour and its head. He contains in himself, by way of all eminency, all the officers in his church. And many of the names are attributed to him in the scriptures. He is our apostle, our teacher, our pastor, our minister, our bishop, the only lawgiver in Zion. It belongs to his majesty from his throne of glory to rule and teach the church through his word, by the spirit, through the ministry of men. In this way, he exercises his own authority and enforces his own laws to the edification and establishment of his kingdom. So how does Christ rule today? He rules through the word of God, which is given to you through the elders, through the word of God read in your homes and from the word of God preached in the pulpit, Christ exercises his kingship. 
uh, when the minister speaks, when the word of God is preached accurately by any man who stands here, it is carrying the same authority as if God were here in person. As much as we correctly interpret the scriptures, it's as though God is speaking through a man. That's how serious the preaching of the word of God is. And so because the word of God is so serious, because he's given this task of preaching to be done through the word of God, he tells us to submit to that preaching. Look at verse five. He says, likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Be subject to the elders. You say, hold on a second, Luke, didn't you say we have to submit to the teaching? Now it says here, the elders. Well, it says the elders take the teaching of God and give it to you that you must submit to it. I'm sure most people in the room have heard of John MacArthur. And he was once asked, uh, what authority does a pastor have? And his answer might surprise many people. He says, a pastor has no authority at all. He's passing on God's message from the word of God and that's where his authority comes from. Only as he agrees with the word of God. But when the pastor agrees with the word of God, when he passes on the message to you and it's really God's message, you do have to listen to it. It's not an optional kind of, I can take it or leave it. These are God's words and when they're preached and interpreted correctly, you have to submit yourself to them. Be subject to the elders. So let's just think, what does this actually mean and what doesn't it mean? Well, well, it doesn't mean that your pastor is Lord Commander. He can't tell you where to live. He can't tell you what you're going to eat for your breakfast, how you should spend your servings. All those decisions are your own decisions. He's not a dictator over you to make every decision. There is something we call sphere sovereignty. We don't interfere too much in people's family lives unless there's serious sin there. We don't interfere with people's work life, again, unless there's some sin issue which needs correcting. We recognize that the authority of ministers is to declare God's word to you. And as much as it lines up properly with the word of God, you are to obey it as if God spoke it himself. For example, if the pastor says to you, let's not give up meeting together, as is the habit of some, but encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Whose idea is that? Well, that's God's idea, isn't it? That's the book of Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, you have to listen to that instruction. Or if you're considering who you should be in a relationship with and the pastor says, well, let me show you the scriptures. It says we're not to be unequally yoked to an unbeliever. If he's bringing you God's word, you have to submit to that as if God is speaking himself because he is through the elders. If he comes to you with a word of correction, a pastor or an elder, if it lines up with the scriptures, then you are to receive it. You might not like what's been said, but God says to listen and submit because he's the minister who's put there for your good. You might not like it, but this is what the scripture says, isn't it? As long as it's biblical, we must submit to the elders. So what if an elder comes along and says, and to a single woman, just this is an example of one I've heard in real life, he says, oh, the Lord has told me that we're to be having sex together. That's what a certain minister did who I, who I knew of. Well, if he's asking you to sin, if he's going against the scriptures, he's to be ignored, he's to be rebuked because he doesn't have the authority to contradict God's word. You only have to listen to your pastor if he's in line with, in line with the scriptures. Uh, so for me as the pastor here, if I say something to you and it doesn't line up with the word of God, please um, feel free to ignore it. If you think I'm overstepping the place God's given me, please speak to me about it because we are sinners and we are capable of making bad choices. We only have authority so long as it lines up with the word of God. That's all we're here for, to point you to Christ, to point you to his word and to encourage you to put it into practice with the power of the Spirit. 
So yes, we need to listen to our pastors, but only if they're in line with the word of God. And who did Peter single out there? Did you notice? He said, likewise, those of you who are younger. I think there's two senses that Peter's using the word younger here. At first, literally, he's talking about the young people in the church, isn't it? The young people need to listen to the elders. You know, as younger people, we are prone to insubordination. When you're at school, the young people, you just see them cheeking off the teachers. You see them doing bad stuff. They just love to get detention, don't they? I was the same when I was at school. If you look just in our recent history, the hippie movement of the 60s, the swinging 60s so-called, the anarchist movement, the punk movement, these were all started by, by younger people. Sometimes we think we know better, just like I'm reminded of a Rehoboam and Jeroboam. You remember the story when the northern and southern kingdoms are split? Didn't listen to the advice of the elders. He said, the young ones, we know better, we know how to do things. And it ended in disaster. So Peter's saying to the young people, don't think you know better just because you're younger. It's true that an older person won't always be wiser than you, but respect your elders. Think carefully before going against the advice of those who've gone before us, because wisdom often sits with years in life, doesn't it? So that's the first sense Peter's using the word, is encouraging the young people in the church, but also those who are younger in the faith. You know, your elder's not always going to be older than you in years. Timothy was probably one of the youngest elders in the New Testament, wasn't he? And Paul said, don't let anyone despise you because you're young. But even though Timothy was a young man, we don't know how old he was, maybe 30 or younger, he was still older than others in the faith. He'd still made greater progress in the things of God. And so those who were younger should listen to him. Often the elders, the pastors, they have the wisdom. Just give you an example of this. You'll have maybe heard of a false teacher called N.T. Wright. Have you heard of his name? Um, An English bishop. And he made this thing up called the new perspective on Paul. He said, Paul's not really talking about salvation in the book of Romans. It's more to do with joining the community and this sort of thing. And a guy called D.A. Carson, a wise pastor, he says, well, this isn't the new perspective on Paul at all. This thing's hundreds and hundreds of years old. I think I recognize it from the writings of A.D. um, 40. This heresy was around. So it wasn't a new perspective at all. And this elder, D.A. Carson, he already knew. He said, I've heard this nonsense before. It's not new at all. It's been seen. It's been been refuted. It's been refuted. And we shouldn't follow it. The elders already had the wisdom. Be subject to the elders. And it's interesting that word there, be subject. You know the story of Jesus when he went to the temple as a boy? He kind of got separated from his parents and he said, oh, did you not know that I must be at my father's house? I must be about his business. And it almost looks for a second as if Jesus was being cheeky, but it's not. It tells us immediately after, and he was subject to his parents in all things. It's the same Greek word here. We're to be subject to the elders like the children are subject to their parents so long as what they're telling us is from the word of God. And we must always test that. We must be like the Bereans who, you know, Paul came to preach at Berea. And they said, we're going to test what Paul says against the scriptures. Imagine that. He said, we're going to put the apostle Paul and check him just to make sure he's not a dodgy false teacher. And you have to do the same with any pastor who's over you. Check his teaching against the scripture. Does he really have the right to be stepping into your life the way he is? Is scripture behind him or is this just his own ideas? Test everything against the word of God. And perhaps you're a bit older and you're thinking, amen, the young people should listen, they should pull their act together. Well, in verse five, um, Paul tells all of us, doesn't he? Sorry, Peter. It's easy to say Paul when you're preaching in the New Testament, isn't it? And Peter says, verse five, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. 
And that includes everyone, doesn't it? All of you need to be humbling yourselves. You need to be listening to one another, being gracious with one another. All of you clothe yourselves with humility. Not sure if you've noticed this, but in your own life, you don't have all the wisdom, do you? That's why God puts us in a church community. You know, some people will be ahead of you in different areas. Some people will be behind you. Some people have been through the same struggles you've been through or are about to go through. In church, you can, you can actually learn from anyone, from the youngest believer to the oldest believer. You know, sometimes when we've been a Christian a while, we need the new Christians to come in, don't we, with their fresh zeal, their fresh appreciation for the truth. And those who are just coming into the faith, they need the older believers to guide them a little bit and say, just put the brakes on here and look to Christ. We all need to be submitting and humbling ourselves before each other if we're to, to live in a healthy church community. And you say, well, I'm not sure this submission stuff's for me. Well, consider this. Even Christ submitted himself, didn't he, when he came to this world? He chose to go under the Father for a season, to listen to him, to be found in appearance of a man, to be found in weakness. It talks about that in Philippians chapter 2, doesn't it? Puts it this way it says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. That each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, been born in the likeness of men, been found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Even Christ submitted himself to the Father, didn't it? It can't be beneath us if even Christ himself was willing to do it. Now humility is it's the foundation of all our relationships in the church, isn't it? You know, my kids, when they were at kinder, they teach them different rules that like have gentle hands with each other, don't be fighting with the other kids. And one of the slogans at the kindy was others before self. And really, that's in the scriptures as well, isn't it? Others before self. How does Paul put it in Ephesians 4? He says, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Also in Matthew chapter 20, it says, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants, wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Humility, we must humble ourselves before one another. It's there over and over again in the scriptures. It's one of those repeated teachings which you can't ignore when you read in the New Testament. So let's ask the question then, why should we bother with this? Why should we submit to our elders? Why should we be humble towards one another? What's going to happen if we do, and what's going to happen if we don't? Well, the answer's actually there for you in verse five, isn't it? Look with me there at verse five. He says, for God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. First and, first and negative of them, what's gonna happen if you just rebel against your elders, if you just go around church full of pride, if you're just a proud person, what's gonna happen in your life? Well, God's going to oppose you, it says. And you see this all the way through the scriptures, don't you? Do you remember Moses when he was in Egypt? He says, the God of the Israelites says, let my people go. And what did Pharaoh say? I, I don't know this Lord. I, I don't know the guy you're talking about. And God opposed him, didn't he? Plague after plague after plague until finally the firstborn was dead and there was a great cry in all of Egypt. So Moses takes them into the wilderness and the people rebelled against Moses, didn't they? They said, we don't like this Moses character. We think he's a bad leader. We think he's not God's man after all. And in particular, the sons of Korah rebelled against Moses. And what happened? Do you remember the story, Numbers 16? 
And the ground opened up and swallowed the families whole, didn't it? He jumped forward, Nebuchadnezzar, what happened to him? He thought, well, he, was, he thought he was king, didn't he? He's walking on his balcony and he said, isn't this the great Babylon which I've created for myself? And, and God said, I'm going to give you seven years of humility now until you know that the Lord is God. He said, well, that's just the Old Testament. What about the New Testament? Well, consider the Pharisees. They make quite a few appearances, don't they? And Jesus humbled, humbled them again and again and again uh, before finally in AD 70, he got rid of their, of their man-centered religion. It had completely departed from the gospel and he destroyed the temple. If we rebel against our elders, if they're teaching us the word of God, if they're actually giving us the truth, if we're awful to others in the church, we shouldn't be surprised if God disciplines us he opposes those who are proud. You see it again and again and again and again in the scriptures. But positively, God gives a, a promise here, doesn't he? He says he, he, gives, he opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And also when you follow the Bible, you actually find, find that story being told again and again and again as well. He remembers Hezekiah, he's dying doesn't want to die, feels he's still got some work to do. He cries before God, says, God, forgive me of my sins. And God says, I'll give you an extra 15 years of life. And all of that bad stuff's going to happen in your lifetime. I'm going to postpone the judgment. We saw King Manasseh just a few weeks ago, didn't we? A terrible sinner. But he bowed before God and said, God, forgive me for my witchcraft, for my abominations, for putting my sons in the fire. Forgive me of all my sins and God forgave him, didn't he? He gave him a new heart, he gave him a new way. And of course in the New Testament we know that story of the Pharisee and the tax collector, don't we? The tax collector, it says, he wouldn't lift his eyes up to heaven but he beat his breast saying, God be merciful to me, the sinner. It says he went to his house justified. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace upon grace to the humble. What's this mean for us? It means if we humble ourselves before God, he will pour his grace into our life. He'll be merciful to us. He'll set our feet upon a rock. He'll be the voice saying, this is the way, walk in it. He'll lead us gently through the wilderness to the promised land. He opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now, I'm, su I'm super thankful in this church we don't have any craziness at the moment and there's not much resistance to the ministry at all. People seem to love the word of God and, and let's keep it that way. That's a good thing, isn't it? And to look at God's word and say, what do the scriptures say and what should we be doing to listen to the scriptures? Your elders are always going to be imperfect men, but as much as what we say lines up with God's word, it's to be obeyed, isn't it? Not because we're saying it, not because we're special, but because God says it and passes on the message through his ambassadors. So if you're in a church where you can't listen to the elders because they're going beyond the scriptures, they're trying to control you in unhealthy, unhealthy sort of ways, or you can't listen to the elders because they don't know the word of God and they don't respect the word of God, well, it's time to find some elders who you can submit to, isn't it? No one's going to be perfect, of course, but your elders should at least be worthy of following. If they're not, you need to find a church where they're... Uh, and because everybody needs elders, don't they? Everyone needs a shepherd. Even the shepherds need a shepherd. <laughs> Both a human shepherd, an under-shepherd, and the Lord Jesus himself, the good shepherd of the sheep. And as Peter says this, you know, he's assuming that they have elders, isn't he? Imagine someone just walks in off the street and says, no, nah, I don't go to church, I don't, I don't worship anywhere. How are you going to listen to this sermon? How are you going to put it into practice when you don't have any elders? It's impossible, isn't it? You're not even on the first run of the ladder. How can you listen to your elders if you don't have any? It's the same with people who don't go to church, who say they're believers, isn't it? How can you obey the scriptures if you don't even have any elders? So in corrupt churches, they'll often preach on these verses again and again and again. We're just coming to it because we're going through the scriptures, but we must submit to the elders as much as they line up with God's word. 
And yet there's something in the text which is, is far more fundamental, isn't it? And this leads us to our second point. We've seen the truth that we must submit to elders, but now let's consider the truth that we must submit to the Lord. We must submit to the Lord. So Sir Peter has been talking all these different truths which we've been looking at, and now he begins to apply them in verse 6. Take a look with me there. He says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. He says, In light of everything I've just been talking about, about the different relationship you know, between the elders and the congregation and the young people, he says, All of you, humble yourselves before God. And what's the first context here of what Peter's saying? If we put the verse into the context, Peter's saying, as you submit to your elders, you're actually submitting to God. Does that make sense? So someone says, yep, I follow Christ, okay? How do you follow Christ? Well, I follow him through his, his word. Okay, and what does his word tell you to do? It says, submit to the elders. So there can't be a real submission to Christ if we're not in a local church and willing to put ourselves under elders. Do you see the connection in Peter's mind there? He says, as you submit to the elders, you're doing what God wants you, wants you to do. Humble yourself before God as you submit to the elders. And But it's also much more than that, isn't it? It's much broader when you talk about humbling yourself before God. It's not just listening to the elders. There's so much more to it than that. And there are so many bad ideas which pop up in your mind when you hear about humbling yourself. You know the Roman Catholic Church, I'm sure you do. And they have these strange kind of pilgrimages all over the world, don't they? And people go on long walks for a long time, not just because they enjoy the walk, but that they hope to earn salvation by it. And the really serious Catholics, some of them, you see them beating themselves up, literally. They call it flagellation, don't they? They whip their own backs and they think, now I'm, now I'm really having a bad time. Now I'm, I'm being really humble. How God's going to have to give me salvation because look how much I'm suffering. And that's actually just pride, isn't it? It's not humility at all. Humility is listening to God's word and what he says. It's realizing, yes, I'm a sinner, that's true. I deserve to be punished, that's also true. But Christ has taken my punishment. I'm trusting in him. I'm believing what he says. I believe that when he says, whoever believes in me has eternal life, I'm going to rest myself in that promise. That's humility, isn't it? It's not beating yourself up, saying lots of bad things about yourself. I'm a worm, I'm a maggot, all this sort of thing. That can just be pride, can't it? It's putting yourself in your proper place in relation to God. And there's a great example of humility in the Old Testament in the life of Job, isn't there? Do you remember the story of Job? He's full of pride. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell God exactly how it is. I'm going to tell him how obedient I've been, how I've kept my hands so clean and pure, and he's not going to tell me anything. And eventually God appears out of the midst of the whirlwind and he has a little chat with Job, doesn't he? He says, where were you when the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy when I laid the foundation of the earth? He said, have you ever in your days commanded the morning light and the sun? Where does the light come from and where does the darkness reside? Can you lead out the stars in their season? Do you know where the deer gives birth? Just a few questions in and Job realizes, actually, I've been very proud. He says to God, I uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you and I despise myself and repent in the dust and the ashes. What did Job realize? He realized, well, God is God and I'm a man. He's in his place and I'm in my place. He humbled himself before God. He put himself in his proper place. That's what humility is. You know, Satan's sin in the garden, his sin was trying to put himself in God's place, wasn't it? 
And men are still doing it today. We're still in our pride, wanting to take God's place, but humility recognizes God is the creator and we are the creatures. It's what it means to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Also describes to you what this humility looks like because there's a problem with humility, isn't there? You can never really tell if you're being humble or not. You know, if someone's walking around saying, I'm, I'm so humble, I just feel that I'm so humble right now and just... Well, it's a statement of pride, isn't it? It's a statement of pride. And someone who might be saying, I feel so proud and so weak, well, you know, perhaps they're walking in humility at that moment because they're thinking the right thoughts about themselves. How do we know when we're being humble or not? It's difficult, isn't it? Well, in verse number seven... It shows you what humility looks like. It might not have been what first springs to mind, but it is is in context what God says. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. How do you know if you've been humble or not? Well, what do you do with your problems? Are you a self-sufficient problem solver? Do you think I'm I'm gonna try my best, try my hardest, dig my heels in, and God's gonna... Reward me for that? Or do you come like a little child to his father? Father, help me. Do you bring your anxieties to him, believing that he cares for you? Because that's true humility, isn't it? Let me give you some examples of this. Let's say your finances are running low. Do you start making a five-step plan of how you're going to improve your business, how you're going to do this and that? Or do you come to God and say, God, you've told me that you'll provide all all my needs for me. Please help me, I need your grace. Or when health starts to decline and you're feeling weak and and powerless, do you think, well, I'm I'm gonna grab myself by the bootstraps and save myself? Or do you say, God, help me in this season of sickness. Help me to glorify you. Help me to learn what I'm going to learn. Do you commit your kids to God or do you think that you can save them yourself? Do you say, Lord, save my children, work in them, I need your grace in their hearts. These are examples of humility, aren't they? Not running in headlong, trying to do everything for ourselves, but coming to God in prayer. Now, how much do you pray? How much do I pray about things? Because that shows how humble we really are, doesn't it? You know, quite often in our prayer meeting, sometimes when we're together in a smaller group, we'll ask, does anyone have anything for prayer? And quite often people say, no, I'm actually fine. And do you know that they've just gone a little bit off kilter in that moment because none of us are fine, are we? We've all got needs. We all need grace every moment of every day from God. You could say, I need need forgiveness of sins. I need my daily bread. I I need forgiveness. I need strength to forgive others. We all have needs, don't we? As sinners, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Put yourself in your proper place and trust him for what you need. You know, on a morning before school, my uh, kids, they have these, a uh, Micah and Phoebe, they have their backpacks and I put their lunch in and their shoes and everything. And at the moment, they're so young, they say, Dad, it's too heavy. We can't carry it. I'm, I'm pretty sure they can carry it, but it's, it's too heavy for us. We can't do it. And, and they burst into tears. And then I say, come on then, I'll, I'll grab the bags. And, and dad picks them up and puts them in the car. And, and then they're free again, aren't they? And it's the same with God. You know, when you're humble, you stop trying to carry your own bag and you ask your father to do it. You stop trying to carry your own burdens and you look to him. That's the truly humble person, isn't it? One who prays and gives everything to God. As the psalmist said, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. You know, sometimes do you ever ever wake up early hours of the morning and you're just anxious, you're thinking about something and it's four o'clock in the morning. Well, this is a great verse for that time, isn't it? Instead of worrying and making a five-step plan, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. He truly, truly does. And there's also a promise attached, isn't there? 
Cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. And at the proper time, he will exalt you. He will exalt you, he'll bring you out of the situation or he'll give you the grace to endure it. Just think in the Old Testament for a moment with me about Joseph. You remember Joseph's story? He was thrown down into the hole and then the Midianites came and purchased him, took him off to Egypt. The terrible life, wasn't it? And then he was there, things were looking up again and then his Potiphar's wife accused him of adultery and where's he end up? In, in the dungeon. And then he gives a prophetic vision to a man and he thinks, yes, I'm going to get out and, and the guy forgets about him for a few more years. It would have been easy, wouldn't it, to say, God, what are you doing? What's going on in my life? And yet Joseph humbled himself, didn't he? And what happened? Eventually God exalted him to be the ruler over all of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh himself. And it's the same with us as Christians, isn't it? It's, it's coming. Our exaltation is coming, whether it's in this world and God brings us out of a situation or whether it's on the last day, on the day of judgment, when we stand clothed in his righteousness. And but even where he's going to exalt us, he's going to bring us out of the suffering and into his glory. This is the promise we have when we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. So let's ask some questions of application as we close this evening. Well, it's been great to come to the book of First Peter again. We're again close to the end of the book now before we start something else. But before Peter signs off, he wants to speak about elders, doesn't he? Submit to your elders. And so the first question of application tonight, do you have any elders? I know some of you do. I know some of you come to this church, some of you... I go to other churches, but some people listen online and don't go to church at all. They've told me, I don't go to church, I just listen to your sermons online. I'd like to say to those people, stop that, please. Stop listening to them online. Find yourself a local church where you can sit under a ministry and hear the gospel. Of course, you can watch the sermons online, but don't let that be a substitute for going to church. You've got to have elders over you who can care for your soul. This is God's plan for your good. Uh, to the rest of you who do have elders, are you submitting to them as much as what they say is in line with the scriptures? If they're going beyond the scriptures, of course, you don't have to listen, but when they come with biblical correction, are you listening to them? Uh, just remember when you sometimes think, I'm going to kick against the elders, I'm going to kick up a stink, a God opposes the proud, doesn't he? But he gives grace to the humble. Always remember, your elders are men who have to give an account for you on the day of judgment. They have to talk about you with God on that day. They make their life easier by listening to the instructions so long as they line up with God's word. Another question to all of us, are we living in humility in the church, in church family? All of us can learn from other people, can't we? I remember once being in England and I was struggling with something. It was really difficult. And there was a disabled girl in the congregation. And I can't remember how she did it. I don't remember the context of the conversation, but she brought me out of that hole. You know, and looking at her, you might not have thought that she was all, all, all together there, all together compass mentis, but spiritually she was right on the mark. And she pulled me out of the miry bog by saying something and... I was back in a place of joy. You've always got something to learn from every believer in the church. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. We live in, in humility with one another. And the ultimate test of our humility, are we praying to God? Are we bringing our problems to him? How much are you praying? How much am I praying? How much are we struggling because we're not bringing things to God at the start of the day. He's ready to listen to us, isn't he? When you wake up in the morning, he's ready to listen to your prayers. Come to him. Pray that your prayers will go up like the morning sacrifice to God and that you'd humble yourself before him and find grace to help you in a time of need because we've all got needs, haven't we? In a prayer meeting, there's no one who can say, I've got nothing to pray about. I don't need anything from God. All of us need his help. So I pray that he'd help us to 
humble ourselves before elders that he'd help me with that as well. I have 25 elders with lots of different opinions. It's not always easy to be under elders who disagree with you, is it? But it is for our good. And I pray that all of us would learn to humble ourselves before God and bring our concerns to him. Amen.